Hi, welcome to Road to Vostok Devlog episode 4. If you're new to this channel, here's a quick intro before we start. My name is Antti, I'm the developer of Road to Vostok. Road to Vostok is a hardcore single player survival game set in a post apocalyptic border zone between Finland and Russia. My goal is to build the best realistic hardcore survival game out there, and these devlog videos are my way of documenting this journey. Since the last devlog episode, which was about looting and how to improve the looting experience in survival games, there have been a lot of new people who have followed this project, and for this reason I thought that this devlog episode would be about game design in order to explain some core design elements of the game. If you haven't yet watched that first introduction devlog episode, I would highly recommend watching that first and then continue watching this video, because that first introduction episode explains all the basics and provides a good foundation for understanding the vision of this project. But I understand that watching a 30 minute introduction video may be too time consuming for some, so here's a quick summary of that first devlog episode related to game design. The game world of Road to Vostok is divided into three main zones. These are called Area 5, Border Zone and Vostok. Area 5 is a low risk starting zone, Border Zone is basically a transition zone, and Vostok is a dangerous and mysterious high risk zone, which is mostly designed for end game content and main goal for the player. The main idea is that you start from the area of 5, you loot, plan and prepare your way across the border zone and then enter the Vostok. This idea is based on this horizontal difficulty, where the game gets harder each time you move towards east and finally when you decide to enter the Vostok, you are within the permitted zone. That's basically the core idea of this game. But in this devlog episode, I want to dive a little deeper and explain how I view game design and game production from the perspective of full-time solo indie game developer. I basically want to explain what Road to Vostok is really trying to achieve and what kind of gameplay experience I want to provide through this game. At this point, I also want to emphasize that this video isn't a tutorial about game design. Each game project is totally unique and there isn't any universal truth for designing video games. These are just my opinions and views around designing a large-scale commercial video game like Road to Vostok. In this devlog episode, I'm going to cover two main topics, which are design principles and the experience. After these topics, I also want to showcase a specific tool that I've been using recently for game design and which has helped me organizing all my design elements into one convenient ecosystem. Enjoy the devlog! Let's start from the very basics. Video games are software and entertainment products and there are certain design principles that are linked to the development process of the game. Typically, video games are made with the following development process, there's main phases like pre-production, production and post-production. On top of these main phases, there's also things like milestones, development sprints and different events like launching the game and so on. The main point here is to understand that there are different phases and tasks related to which part of the production the game is. For example, in pre-production, the development focus is around the core vision of the game, development resources, whether it's team members, tools or financials, and there's usually also some sort of planning related to the production timeline and roadmap of the game. Then there's the main production phase, which basically means the actual part of the production process where the game is built and all the features are implemented. At this phase, the focus is around the actual development, but there's also things like marketing and playtesting in order to make sure things are going in the right direction. And then, after the main production phase, when the game has been launched, there's post-production. At this phase, the production focus shifts more towards tasks that improve the game's so-called self-life, meaning developers want to make sure that the game has a player base that won't just vanish after the launch. During this post-production phase, most of the efforts are usually put into community, feedback and future content in order to increase that self-life. This development process demonstration is really simplified, but usually each commercial video game production goes through something like this. And now, if we want to talk about game design and design principles, it's important to understand also that game design isn't just a single task that starts and ends in this development process. Game design is something that cycles and flows constantly along with these phases, and each phase contains different kinds of elements related to game design. In this devlog episode, however, I want to focus mostly on the game design and principles that happen in the pre-production phase. I strongly believe it's probably the most important phase for the whole production, and unfortunately, it's pretty common that many developers and designers are way too impatient to spend enough time in this phase. 
I would even argue that most games that fail during the production phase, whether it's related to game idea, development team or financial resources, there's pretty good chance that the core issue was the developers rushed their pre-production phase. This argument might seem a little weird at first, but let me explain why this pre-production is so important to get right when we are talking in context of game design. I'm going to approach this topic through a number of principles that I used for Road to Vostok when I was designing this game. If you look at this timeline, I basically spent the whole year in 2021 for pre-production and I followed these specific design principles in order to make sure that I really knew what I was doing before I entered the actual production phase. And now let's look at those design principles. This first principle is all about understanding what you are trying to achieve and why. This principle requires tons of patience, because you should write down your rough ideas to more structured form and make a proper design document which basically acts like a mission plan for the upcoming production. One key element that design documents should always include is also a clear explanation about the actual player experience that you want to provide through this game idea. You should basically write down emotions, feelings and experiences that the player should feel when he's playing your game. Unfortunately, I cannot show my actual design document for Road to Vostok yet, because there are multiple things that I don't want to reveal at this stage, but I can still show you that written player experience part. Here's the player experience that I wrote down in 2021. It's nothing fancy, but in my opinion, it's still important to write these things down, because this is basically the vision that you are trying to pursue with your upcoming production. I'm going to cover more of this experience topic in the next chapter of this video. But now you might be wondering, what is that mysterious enemy box? Well, basically I structured these principles in a way that each principle contains a different enemy that is hurtful to the project and game design. So in this case, if you don't know your product and you decide to skip this design document that I talk about, or you're loosely defining the player experience, the enemy of this specific design principle is a thing called identity crisis. Identity crisis is basically an unwanted situation in the production, where the game idea is drifting all over the place and there isn't any coherent vision for the project. I'm sure you have seen some projects that have suffered from this design enemy, and if you ask me, each time you see a project that has an identity crisis, there's a pretty high chance that the reason lies in the pre-production and how the developers rush this specific part of the game design. The next principle is proof of concept. I think this principle is widely misunderstood in multiple areas of game development. I would even argue that most new game developers who are designing games think that proof of concept is some kind of prototype that you should have to build in order to find out if your game idea is good. I personally think that proof of concept and prototype are totally different things. Yes, proof of concept is something that should reflect and validate your game idea but you should not have to validate it yourself. Proof of concept is something that already exists in the market and something that has a similar player base and market group that would be interested about your game idea also. Sure, you can design totally cool and unique game ideas that don't exist in the market, but then in my mind you are also taking a huge gamble with your game idea. If you can't name a similar game like yours, or you can't show an existing player base that would probably like your game idea also, then you are in a situation where you just have to hope that there will be people interested about your game when it launches. And I think this let's just hope situation is always pretty risky when you are designing a game. I'm not saying that unique ideas are always bad, but the reality is that if you are designing a commercial game that requires years of production and hard work, I would be much more confident about my game idea if there's already some proof of concept in the market. In this context, it's also good to remember that competition is always a good thing, and instead of trying to find these perfect and unique ideas, I would much rather focus on improving, innovating, or maybe finding some new cool angles to already proven game ideas. I think this mindset to game design is pretty healthy, and provides a good foundation to the game you're designing. Now let's look a couple of examples. When I was designing Road to Vostok, I did quite extensive market research in order to understand the hardcore survival game genre, and after this research, I think I can pretty confidently name over 10 proof of concept for Road to Vostok. But in this video, let's go through the three main ones. The first proof of concept is the Stalker franchise, and especially the mods like Stalker Anomaly and Stalker Gamma 
that represents the modern stalker experience. I think it's pretty obvious that there are lots of people who are drawn to the atmosphere and sandbox-like gameplay of these stalker mods. It's also quite mind-blowing that the experience that modded stalker can provide is something that people still find really enjoyable, even considering that the original game was released 14 years ago. I think this is a good proof of concept that if a game could provide a similar experience in a modern engine and fresh setting, there could be people who would find that game interesting. The second proof of concept is Daisy and its permitted approach to survival gameplay. Even though Daisy is a multiplayer game with open world and fantasy elements like zombies, I still consider that Daisy has proven that there are people who are willing to play these hardcore games even if the risk of dying is losing all your progress through permanent. I personally don't play Daisy that much anymore. I'm kind of grown out from zombies and I think the current gameplay loop is a bit boring, but Daisy still provides this awesome player driven storytelling platform, so I think Daisy is a proof of concept in this sense also. Meaning, if you are designing a hardcore survival game, you don't necessarily have to force any specific narratives or big story elements to the game world. Then the final proof of concept is Escape from Tarkov. I have huge respect for Tarkov and how they took a risk for designing a hardcore shooter RPG hybrid which didn't exist in the market. For me, Tarkov proved that hardcore shooter experiences are really compelling and people enjoy mastering those nuanced weapon mechanics and stats that are linked to the gear and equipment. I also think Tarkov is a good proof of concept in terms of map design, and how these types of games can be enjoyable even without huge open world maps. These were the three main proof of concepts for Road to Vostok, and the point here was not just to mention popular games and believe they will somehow automatically provide the audience for your game idea, but I'm pretty sure you understand what I tried to demonstrate with these examples. But now, what's the design enemy of this principle? This time, it's lack of interest. Which might happen if you design a game without any proof of concept or existing player base who would be interested about your game idea. Now it's time to talk about prototypes and why they are important to game design. The first thing is that if you're designing a game with totally unique game idea and there's no proof of concept and you still want to take this gamble, that I mentioned in the previous design principle, then the main point of the prototype is to find out if your game idea is actually fun and if there's interest towards this unique game idea. If this is your starting point, then I would see that prototype is something that you should build as soon as possible and organize playtesting events as much as you can in order to find out if your unique idea is appealing and all this should be done before the production phase. But then, if the situation is like in Road to Vostok, where there's multiple proof of concepts in the market already, then the purpose of the prototype in my mind is a bit different. In this case, I would see that prototype is something that you build in order to avoid surprises in the production phase and something that helps you understood the marathon that is ahead of you. The metaphor here is that prototypes are basically your small running exercises and drills in order to find out if you have the right shoes or motivation for the actual marathon, which is the production phase. I will now explain this mindset through some Road to Vostok prototypes that I did in the pre-production phase. The presentation of these following images and videos is going to be a little all over the place, but hopefully you get some points of how these are linked to the principle that I'm trying to showcase here. These first screenshots are from the FPS prototype that I did in 2021. By this time I had all the core ideas for Road to Vostok pretty much planned out and I knew what I wanted to develop but instead of rushing into the production, I did a bunch of small prototypes like this. The point of this prototype was to find out how hard it is to make a somewhat modern FPS controller. This meant that I decided to make a minimum viable product for a modern FPS controller and learn all the nuances that it required and how much time it took me to make one. Yes, I could have just bought some pre-made controller asset from the Unity Asset Store, which is a totally wise thing to do in order to save time, but when you are working on a project of this size, like Road to Vostok, you cannot rely solely on pre-made assets, because the scope of the project would require so many different assets from different creators, so the codebase would quickly become totally uncontrollable and extremely hard to debug. At least, this is my experience with large-scale projects that utilize tons of code-based pre-made assets. So I did this controller prototype from scratch back in 2021. With this same mentality, I also did an enemy AI navigation 
heat registration and ragdoll prototypes. Here's a few video clips related to this. Some other prototype things that I did back in pre-production was location-based map design, modeling and tool development. This is because Road to Vostok is based on real abandoned places, so I had to choose a prototype location that would give me a picture how hard it is to design and implement real-life locations to the game. My prototype location in pre-production was this ghost town and former Soviet radar station in Latvia called Skrunda 1. This specific location actually simulated quite well for some maps that I had in mind for Vostok side of the game. I didn't visit this location personally, but I scavenged a large collection of reference images and then I started working on the prototype. I basically modeled all the main buildings from Skrunda 1 and took notes on things that were annoying and time consuming, in order to avoid these situations in the production phase. For example, I found out that old Soviet buildings like this have tons of tightly packed rooms and corridors which are time consuming to unwrap and texture. So the solution that arises from this example is a custom building shader that automates pretty much all of these time consuming tasks which are related to rooms and corridors. There were multiple small revelations like this that came from this Grunda 1 prototype. But the important point here is that I learned all these while I was in pre-production, so I had plenty of time to analyze and develop these solutions. But if I had been in a production phase at this time, there's a pretty high chance that I would have just tried to brute force this. Because you're in the middle of the production, there's all kinds of distractions and deadlines, so you easily lose this ability to think ahead and analyze. I probably did near 20 different prototypes for Road to Vostok when I was in the pre-production. Some of these were kind of boring and useless, but there were some that provided me really important lessons learned moments in terms of game design, and I think through these prototypes I avoided multiple time sinks that otherwise would have caused issues to my current development timeline. And now to the design enemy of prototypes. This time the design enemy is an unrealistic timeline or production surprises. Basically the main point of this design enemy is that you don't want to get unwanted surprises during the production phase, and this is often linked to the prototypes because if you don't spend enough time in making this, it's really hard to estimate milestones for the production, because then you're just basically guessing how much time these tasks might take. Rules, restrictions and guidelines are extremely important if you have a small development team like Road to Vostok. In pre-production, you want to design rules in order to find shortcuts, ways to avoid time-consuming tasks, and in general, you want to set clear boundaries to your upcoming production phase. I want to highlight that these rules that you design in pre-production should be like really hard rules. The point is that you don't break this and you don't change this no matter what. I honestly believe that these rules are sometimes make or break design factor when it comes to delivering a finished game product. Now if we look at my rules, there are basically three simple rules for Road to Vostok that I can't break before I deliver the product and the vision that I designed for this game. The first rule is that no multiplayer, the second rule is no open world, and rule number three, no PPR rendering. These are the main rules for the production, and I strongly believe that if I would break any of these rules, it would be devastating for the whole production timeline, and also I would probably lose all the momentum that I have currently going on for the project. On top of these main rules, I also designed three important guidelines that I try to follow for each development tasks. These guidelines are Design development tools in order to automate annoying tasks Utilize procedural generation for game world and object placement And finally, avoid manual keyframe animations and complex models. There's multiple examples on how these rules and guidelines help the current production, but the main point is that these rules and guidelines save hundreds and hundreds of hours of development time. And even though sometimes it would be compelling to break some of these rules, 
it's important to maintain discipline and say no to those temptations. And now to the enemy reveal. The design enemy of rules and guidelines principle is a big one. It's called feature grip. Feature grip is basically a situation where developers start to implement cool new ideas to the game along with the production and this usually leads to situation where the scope of the project becomes easily uncontrollable or the timeline of the production will become unrealistic. And I honestly think the best way to avoid this enemy is by setting really hard rules and guidelines in the pre-production phase. Order of implementation is a design topic that means that you should try to figure out logical production steps for big time-consuming tasks that involve multiple systems and sub-features. But I think the best way to explain this principle is again through Road to Vostok pre-production example. The following example is all about weapons and how I designed the order of implementation for the weapon system in the game. I basically in pre-production already knew that there will be multiple features that will link to the main weapon system. So my job was to figure out in which order I want to implement these specific weapon features. This image is from my design document that highlights in which order different weapon related features will be brought into the game. At this image you can see that I started from the core weapon features like shooting, hit registration and recall and then if you look at those last features on this order there's stuff like magazines, attachments, arm IK, weapon animations and ballistics. And the main reason why figuring out this order is important for big systems like this is because game development is full with iteration and fine tuning. So this basically means that you should try to implement stuff in a logical order so you can avoid implementing features that will become obsolete whenever there's a new feature on top of it. For example, if you think about weapon animations, if I would implement keyframe based weapon animations immediately at the beginning, they would become obsolete pretty quickly whenever I introduce new stuff like movable weapon attachments or something totally new which isn't supported by those manual keyframe animations. I think this small weapon example is enough to demonstrate this principle. The design enemy of this principle is loss of progress or backtracking. This means that you might have to rework a bunch of features and lose significant progress and time if the order of implementation wasn't logical for the features you had in mind. The last principle that I want to cover in this chapter is playtesting. Playtesting is something that can be done internally within the game studio or externally, but basically playtesting is a pre-planned event where you let others play your game and you can receive feedback from your target audience. I think external playtesting with your target audience is something that should be done multiple times in the production phase, because it's the only way to find out if your implementation of the idea is actually working. Playtesting is always scary and time-consuming to set up from the perspective of the developer, but I think it's just something that has to be done, because it's much better to find out if there's issues and problems during the production phase rather than finding out them after the commercial release. If we look at this timeline that I showed earlier, it was obvious to me back in 2021, when I was in pre-production, that even though Road to Vostok is a long-term project, there has to be playtesting events really early on in the production, so I can make sure that the core mechanics of the game are compelling and the development is going in the right direction. Back then, when I was in pre-production, I decided that there will be two main playtest events for Road to Vostok, and I named these Public Demo 1 and Public Demo 2. Public Demo 1 was designed to give first impressions and show core mechanics of the game, and Public Demo 2 is all about the player experience, gameplay loop, and showcasing the core vision of the game. One important design aspect that I also had with these playtesting demos is something that I call timeline validation. I basically decided that these demos will be development milestones in order to understand my ability to estimate production speed and achieving deadlines in general. Currently, Road to Vostok has achieved this first milestone and there was a public demo 1 playtest event last month. This first playtest demo had over 200,000 players and it was the most popular demo on Steam for multiple days straight. But the most important thing that this demo provided for this project is the timeline validation and target group feedback. The timeline validation in this context means that I basically validated my ability to estimate timelines because I told the timeline for this first playtest demo already back in February when I released that first introduction devlog. This proved me as a developer that I can estimate my development speed and progression almost six months ahead 
and I think this ability is really important to have nowadays, when it's almost a norm that games are delayed and there's all kinds of unrealistic development timelines and rust productions. And then, when it comes to target group feedback, this playtest demo also provided me important feedback data, and I also had the privilege to watch hundreds of gameplay videos and analyze the main issues with the current features and mechanics, even though the project is still very early on in the production. The design enemy of this last principle is tunnel vision. This means that if you don't let others play your game from early on and allow playtesting, you get really easily blinded and lose understanding about what part of the game design is working and what is not. Now it's time to talk about this player experience that I mentioned earlier. In this chapter, I basically want to provide some sort of demonstration of the core vision of Road to Vostok and what this game is really trying to achieve in a big picture. But before I demonstrate this experience, there's one important core design element that should be discussed first. This design element is the main selling point of the game. In my opinion, every video game should have some sort of main selling point, and usually this is either a specific feature or the whole experience that the game is trying to provide, and there's a big difference between these two. In terms of game design, if the main selling point of the game is a feature, then usually the fun in the game is so-called feature-driven. This means that the reason why playing the game is mostly tied to some specific feature which provides that fun. Feature-driven games are usually pretty hard to design, because the main feature should be some kind of unique, clever or satisfying design element that stands out from the competition. But the good thing about these feature-driven games is that they are pretty easy and fast to prototype, because you only have to prototype that specific feature in order to find out if the game idea is fun. Let's look at one example game design, which is totally feature-driven. I'm going to be silent during this example, so you can fully focus on that specific feature. That gameplay clip was from the small indie puzzle game called Leg Breaker. The unique feature in that game was breaking the character's leg each time you jump. So basically you had two jumps for each level. This game is a good example about feature-driven game design, where the main selling point is around this unique feature, which is hard to come up and design, but after you have this unique idea, it's then pretty easy to prototype that. But now, if we think about Road to Vostok, which is a realistic hardcore survival game, we are no longer talking about feature-driven game design. Road to Vostok is a totally experience-driven game, because the main selling point in Road to Vostok is all about survival, looting, gunplay, atmosphere and that punishing gameplay experience which is linked to crossing the border and entering this mysterious permitted zone. And because Road to Vostok is an experience-driven game, the core of the game is actually pretty easy to design, because the game idea isn't that unique and pretty much every game designer can design something similar if they are fans of Stalker or played games like Daisy and so on. The hard part in these experience-driven games is prototyping, because finding out if the game idea is actually fun, it requires so many features and assets in order to test the overall experience. This basically means that if the main selling point of the game is the experience, testing the fun is really slow and time-consuming. And this topic is now directly linked to the previous chapter about design principles, where I tried to emphasize how important the pre-production phase is, because most games nowadays are exactly like Road to Vostok, they are experience driven and they require a huge amount of work before you find out if your game idea is fun or not. The punchline here is that you should try to understand the experience you're designing beforehand and use every method possible in pre-production to prototype the game even though it's difficult and time consuming. It's of course impossible to prototype the full experience in pre-production because you don't have all those necessary features yet 
but there's still ways to try to mimic that experience. And now this is the part of the video where I try to demonstrate you that Road to Vostok experience, even though I can't provide it yet through gameplay footage. There's multiple ways to approach this, but I'm going to use a technique that I call LARPATA. This weird Finnish word comes from the term LARP, which means live action roleplay. This method is really fast and useful if you're designing an experience driven game like Road to Vostok and you must get a small taste of that experience already in pre-production. I'm not going to do any dramatic acting here, but I'm going to provide a small story that is related to the core vision of Road to Vostok. This small story is from my design document back in 2021, but just reading it in this YouTube video would be kind of boring, so I used also some AI generated art and sound effects to provide more immersion to the experience. Enjoy the story. Thank <laughs> you. 
Hopefully that small story provided some insight for the core vision of this game. Even though the images from that story were completely AI generated and not exactly compatible to the style that this game is trying to have, I think the main idea of this dangerous journey is still there. One key point that this story also tried to emphasize is that this game is not designed to be this fast-paced high action shooter where you're constantly fighting with some hostile AI. I want that Road to Vostok can also offer gameplay phases that are totally calm and even relaxing, like going to the lake fishing and so on. I'm sure I will return to this topic at some point, but now let's talk a little about design tools. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned that I wanted to showcase a specific tool that I've been using recently for game design and which has helped me organizing all my design elements into one convenient ecosystem. This specific tool is called Milanote. I found this tool a couple of months ago and I was really impressed how easy to use and intuitive the tool was for game design related tasks. Milanote basically covered all my essential needs when it comes to documenting, task management, mind maps, sketching, and even really specific tasks like designing the AI system and so on. After I used this tool a couple of weeks, I decided to contact Milanote and ask if they would be willing to collaborate and sponsor Road to Vostok's development through this video, and they did. I think collaborations like this are total win-win situations, because independent game developers like me get financial support that helps the development, and cool companies and useful tools like Milanote get exposure through these videos. But I'm pretty sure you might ask, what exactly is Milanote? Let me explain. Milanote is basically this all-in-one tool for organizing creative projects. The main workflow of Milanote is based on this board ideology, where you organize these boards that are placed to contain and organize all your important content and ideas. When you are inside the board, you have a toolbar that contains a bunch of elements that you can just drag and drop inside the board. I really like this workflow because you can organize and modify these elements in so many ways so you can create a unique layout that is just perfect for your project. For example, if we look at Road to Vostok's home view in Milanote, I have this really minimalistic and clean layout and I follow the same style through all my design boards. Here's an example from my map board. This one is from the weapon board. Here's a board for AI design. And this board is for videos and devlog scripts. I honestly think a tool like Milanote is quite perfect for game design and creative projects in general. If you want to test Milanote yourself, you can download the tool and test it for free from their website. The link can be also found in the video description. Huge thanks to Milanote for sponsoring this video and supporting Road to Vostok. Hopefully this devlog was interesting to you. Even though the content in this episode was pretty slow paced, I think this topic around how game design is linked to the development process of the game is really important. I would like to know your opinion on this topic and let me know if you want to see more of these analytical videos in the future also. Thank you for watching and see you in the next episode.